Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're going to be talking about a potential solution to one of the bigger mysteries coming from right here in the solar system. The mystery that we often refer to as the zodiacal light. This very strange glow that you see on the screen right here. Although to be honest, I've met a lot of people over the years that often confuse this with the idea of the Milky Way itself. Milky Way, as you can see, which is this really, really large, beautiful formation in the night skies, that's something that's formed by our own galaxy, and that's something that's thousands and thousands of light years away from us. That's not really what we're looking at here. So this is something completely different from the Milky Way itself that you will see above this image, right in this location. Here's another image of the zodiacal light which doesn't have the Milky Way in it, and here's one of the better images I could find. And so this mysterious glow, or as it's sometimes known, false dawn, because it looks like the sun is about to come up, but it's actually right in the middle of the night, has stayed a mystery for a very, very long time. And even today, the scientists are not entirely clear what creates it, even though the mechanism behind it is understood correctly. So generally, you know that you're looking at zodiacal light when you see this very unusual glow that's somewhat triangular in shape, and that often extends from where the sun should appear, along the sun's path or the zodiac. That's why it's called the zodiacal light. And it's created through a relatively simple mechanism. It's created through scattering of light of some sort of interplanetary dust that's present in the solar system and is most likely tiny, tiny particles, anywhere from 10 to maybe 300 micrometers in length, kind of similar in a sense to what we usually call dust on planet Earth. And the way all of this works is, of course, through the interaction of the solar rays as they strike the surface of these uneven and unequal particles, which then create a lot of outgoing rays in all directions. This is a light scattering effect in a nutshell. And if you'd like to try to see this yourself, you would usually want to find a really dark location because unfortunately the zodiacal light is not really as bright as, for example, moonlight, and is also often overshadowed by the um, emissions from a typical city, so light pollution can be a problem. But for example, after sunset during springtime or before sunrise during the fall, you'll be able to see at least parts of it if you look in the direction of where the sun should be coming out. And it's generally bright enough that you can kind of even see things around you, assuming of course the moonlight is not as strong. And the original theory behind this light was actually proposed after the initial observations from the Pioneer 10 probe, which saw the light back in 1970s, and the scientists back then realized that it must be created by some kind of an interplanetary dust orbiting in the solar system. This probe was able to observe this light on its way to Jupiter. But what wasn't really clear is where the dust is coming from. What's causing so much dust to appear in the solar system to essentially create these observations visible from planet Earth? Well, one natural explanation is, of course, potentially the objects in the asteroid belt or maybe even comets coming close to the sun and close to the inner planets and emitting all sorts of particles on the way. And this is pretty much the explanation a lot of scientists settled for for many years now. By the way, a very similar effect, but on the other side of the solar system, known as Gegenschein, is also visible in certain parts of the world around certain times of the year. But both Gegenschein and Zodiacal Light have something very specific about them that unfortunately doesn't really fit well with the explanation of asteroids and more importantly comets. And that's something to do with the overall orbit of the dust that creates these effects. Even though some of the observations in 2015 from the famous mission to the comet 67P, the mission known as the Rosetta, were able to confirm that certain particles do seem to match the particles coming from this comet, what's unusual here is the orbit. This comet has a very unique orbit. So unique, as a matter of fact, that it took the spacecraft quite a long time to try to catch up with this particular comet. And though it does emit a lot of dust, and this dust obviously has a potential to create a lot of this light, is this dust really the origin of the light that we see pretty much every day in spring and in fall? Is all of this dust indeed responsible for the zodiacal light? Now, some of it might be responsible for it, but did all of this dust really come from comets and asteroids alone? Well, the new study that, as always, you can find in the description below, based on the observations from the beautiful Juno mission, seem to disagree with this, and they have a very valid point to do so. They imply that it does not come from asteroids or comets. Where then? Well, first of all, let's find out how they discovered all of this. Now, look at this probe for a second. Notice something unusual about it. This is a probe with extremely large solar panels. 
the largest created ever, as a matter of fact. Well, at least on spacecraft. And the reason they're so big is really because there is so little sunlight in this location far, far away from planet Earth. We're at a distance of about 5.2 astronomical units away from the sun here, so the amount of sunlight hitting these panels is about 1 25th of what we get on planet Earth. And so the amount of energy this probe gets is not as much. It's as if these panels were about 1 25th of the size. But because they're so large, obviously they also have a lot of surface area. And this makes them a natural, well, a kind of a detector for micrometeorites. Because of the amount of surface area, the amount of collisions these panels experience is going to be really, really high. But wait, I'm rushing into this. Let me actually talk about how all of this happened. To get to Jupiter from Earth, Juno mission had to undergo several different relatively complex maneuvers, including what's known as a slingshot maneuver using Earth as a gravity pool to try to get extra velocity to get to Jupiter. On the way there, it passed through the orbits of Mars and it also passed through the area of the asteroid belt and then essentially arrived at Jupiter. And one of the main purposes for this mission was to try to study the magnetosphere of Jupiter. It's actually done using this magnetometer that you see sticking out above one of the solar panels. And right here on top of this magnetometer are four different stellar trackers or tiny cameras that are responsible for tracking the precise orientation of the probe in order to essentially provide very, very accurate observations of the magnetic field itself. In other words, their main purpose is to tell the probe which way it's facing. Is it facing up? Is it facing down? And so on, in order to get very precise measurements. And by the way, they do so by recognizing different star patterns as they look at various stars and then compare them to the knowledge that we have of the star map around us. But when the probe was still traveling to Jupiter and when it was still transferring from Earth to the Martian orbit, to the asteroid belt and so on, the scientists wanted to test these different cameras and they also at the same time wanted to do a little bit of science. Specifically, they wanted to keep these cameras rolling to obviously test them, but to also possibly discover something that they haven't discovered before, such as maybe some asteroids that we never knew existed. In other words, they program the cameras to report every time they see something unusual, something that's not already in the database, some sort of a streak of light, some kind of unusual star, something that's not known to us. And well, the original assumption was that maybe, just maybe, they'll find one or two, maybe three on the way to Jupiter. Well, as you can probably imagine, that's not at all what happened. They were getting anywhere from a few dozen to several hundred different reports every single day. And this was kind of confusing to the scientists at first until they realized what they were actually looking at or what they were actually seeing that is. Although at first they got super scared thinking that maybe the Juno mission was leaking fuel or something and they were looking at tiny ice particles coming from one of the fuel tanks. Turns out though, what they were observing were tiny, tiny pieces of debris coming from the solar panels themselves, as if something was hitting solar panels really, really fast and thus emitting these tiny streaks of reflective material that then passed in front of the camera. And all of this was dependent on the orbit of where Juno was located. So it wasn't really happening all over the place and even stopped completely as Juno started to approach Jupiter closer. And as you can probably imagine, what they detected were tiny micrometeorite strikes essentially hitting the panels and slowly dislodging tiny pieces that were then captured by cameras hundreds of times per day. Or another way of seeing this is that Juno mission was now inside the interplanetary dust cloud responsible for the zodiacal light. But because the mission profile here involved moving closer to Martian orbit, coming back to Earth, getting a boost and then moving to Jupiter, this allowed the scientists to create a very detailed observation of these collisions through the period of several years. And this, of course, allowed them to create a really beautiful graph that more or less shows us where the probe experienced the highest amount of these collisions. Now, notice that there were actually a couple of comments involved, but none of them would explain the zodiacal lights simply because they're very, very narrowly distributed the majority of collisions seem to have happened right here, between the orbit of Earth and a little bit past the orbit of Mars. Moreover, in this particular graph, you can even see that the amount of collisions seem to have decreased with the higher increase in the asteroid density. But by using old theories, we should assume that more asteroids means more collisions. This was not a fact at all. 
the highest number of collisions experienced were very, very close to the Martian orbit, with the outer edge being roughly around two astronomical units away from the Sun, and the inner edge being just a little bit past the orbit of Earth. And that of course implies that the true culprit of the zodiacal light and all of this interplanetary dust are not asteroids and not comets. It's as a matter of fact, or at least seems to be, planet Mars. All of this dust seems to be coming from Mars and possibly because of various dust storms that always occur here and possibly also end up throwing away some of this dust into interplanetary space. So in other words, this is created by Martian dust or some sort of Martian leftovers. And that by itself is a somewhat mind-blowing discovery, assuming of course they are correct. Although judging by the data they have so far, it is very difficult to argue against the findings in the study. Because remember, asteroids in the asteroid belt don't really have a very sort of circular orbit, they also have very elliptical orbits, they don't have orbits that are somewhat circular and somewhat predictable, yet the zodiacal light does seem to have a somewhat circular orbit very similar to the orbit of Mars. And also since the majority of collisions did happen in this region and not as many happened afterwards, especially once the probe reached the asteroid belt, this sort of makes Mars the main culprit behind the beautiful zodiacal light. Its orbit is circular enough and its orbit is close enough to where the scientists were seeing these collisions to kind of explain most of it. Now obviously not all of the dust in there is going to be from Mars, some of it is definitely from asteroids and some of it is from comets, but the majority of this dust seems to be coming from Mars itself. With Jupiter also acting as a kind of a barrier between the inner and the outer solar systems, pretty much cleaning this whole area around Jupiter from this dust and preventing it from escaping into the outer solar system. At the same time, this also prevents the dust from the outer regions to come closer to the inner solar system as well. So it serves as a kind of a natural barrier between the inner and outer solar systems. But assuming that the scientists are correct and this dust is coming from Mars, the actual mechanism by which all of this dust is produced is not super clear. Mars should have enough gravity to be able to sort of bring back a lot of the dust that tries to escape the planet, and the majority of the planetary dust after, for example, a typical dust storm should not really be escaping and turning into interplanetary dust, thus creating these beautiful effects. However, in this picture from NASA, you can also see that Mars does get very dusty. The storms here can be quite insane. So maybe there is actually some sort of a mechanism that causes Mars to slowly lose some of this dust that then starts orbiting the Sun, creating this unusual dust ring that we call zodiacal light. Or maybe the mechanism here could be similar to how the moon known as Enceladus orbiting around Saturn creates its beautiful E-ring you see in this picture from NASA. Although for Enceladus we know this is because of the geysers present on the surface. How Mars does this is of course another question. It obviously has signs of a lot of volcanism in the past, but all these volcanoes are billions of years old. We don't think any volcanoes erupted here for a very long time. But it's also possible that we could be wrong. And it's also possible that there's something else going on here that nobody else understands. But more importantly, this is also an extremely important discovery for some of the future manned missions. This discovery from the Juno mission and from its transfer from Earth to Jupiter is absolutely crucial for the future survival of potential colonies traveling to Mars. And so definitely a super important discovery. But until we learn more, or until we know something else that's happening to Mars that's causing all of this dust to escape the atmosphere, well, that's pretty much it. Check out the paper in the description, all of the relevant data and links there as well. And maybe subscribe, maybe share this video with someone who loves learning about space and sciences. Maybe come back tomorrow to learn something else. Or support this channel on Patreon by joining the channel membership or by buying the wonderful person t-shirt that features a beautiful Martian design, all of which you can find in the description as well. Either way, stay wonderful. I'll see you tomorrow. And as always, bye-bye.